Hello, good evening. Welcome anyone who comes, one and all. Tonight, we're going to be reading about Coca Pelli. I've always had a fascination with Coca Pelli from a young age. So this is called Coca Pelli, Casanova of the, Quif, of, of the Cliff D Dwellers by John V. Young. Mm -hmm. It's not a very long one. I think we might be able to do all of it tonight. So Coca Pelli, Casanova, Casanova of the Cliff Dwellers, the Hunchbacked Flute Player by John V. Young. Hopi Overlay Bolatai by Fred Cabote. Another picture of Coca Pelli. Hey, Heidi, welcome in. Awesome. Good evening. Coca Pelli. Balls, dude. I'm really, really. Let's, let's go again. <laughs> Coca Pelli. The traveling salesman may have used the flute as a notice to villagers that he was coming in peace and was not an enemy sneaking up on them. Certainly, he has modern counterparts. In Belize, Central America, a group of peddlers take back trails into the remote towns and villages riding bicycles. They are known as cobaneros, since many start from the Guatemalan city of Coban. Their, their predecessors carried shell and tropical goods to the northern pueblos trading for turquoise. The cabaneros bring small consumer goods, some textiles, and trade for money. Today they are considered smugglers. Earlier they were not, as there were no national boundaries. Cocapelli is, be is becoming more popular as yard art. Wrought iron and steel cutouts adorn lawns in Santa Fe and Albuquerque. In Tucson, the security grill of Bati's Indian Arts has wrought, uh, has wrought iron replicas of Cocapelli among images of many pictographs and petrographs, or petroglyphs. As Walter Sprinkler, Cocapelli was a benign minor god bringing abundant rain and food to the people. Cocapelli in Chaco Canyon after waters. You did? You went to Belize? That's awesome. My girlfriend in high school, she went to Belize. It's cool. Right? Was it Belize that she went to? I think so. <laughs> that was a while ago. A bicycle trail is being built between the Grand Canyon and Aspen, Colorado. The first section of Cocapelli's trail now reaches from Grand Junction, Colorado to Moab, Utah. This was written in 1990, by the way, so that could be a little outdated. Built as a joint effort of the Colorado Plateau Mountain Bike Trail Association, the Bureau of Land Management, and the U.S. Forest Service, it was blessed by a delegation of Hopi Indians from Arizona. The trail markers now uh, the trail markers show Cocopelli, with a bicycle and mountains in the background. And this is a picture of hunchback flute play player in cave, on Pajarito Plateau, west of Santa Fe. Spear point, may be later, addition by vandals. Huh, the point, hmm, interesting. They're saying that the spear point may be an addition later. I wonder why. <clears throat> Ooh, oh my gosh. And the, the barrier reef and the best meal, that's awesome. That's cool. So photos are by the author, John V. Young. Um, Heather Hamilton has prepared drawings and sketches from other sources cited. Paul and Diana... Lamarbe have provided illustrations from their Southwest sunscreen painted fabrics. Other illustrations are from early travel and scientific books and publications of the late 19th century. This is Gila Bend Cocapelli, compared with Chaco and Ori o, Ora o, Oraibi after waters. Man, it's a hot, it is a hot one. 
I'll say. <laughs> this other picture, faded by time and weathering, flute player among petroglyphs in Rio Grande Canyon between Los Alamos and Santa Fe. Note recent edition of Plumed Ser Serpent. Hmm. Hey, Matthew, welcome in. Good to see you. Happy August. Preface. Everywhere that primitive man roamed the American Southwest, as well as in many other places in the world, he left an enduring record of his passing fancies and urgencies in the form of pictures on rocks. Those, those painted on rock surfaces are called pictographs, those incised in the rock surface by pecking or scratching with a stone tool are called petroglyphs. To us, many of the designs are undecipherable, but many others seem to be more or less obvious representations of deer, antelope, bighorn sheep, bears, wolves, coyotes, buffalo, turkey, cranes, serpents, frogs, lizards, and insects. Hands and feet often appear, sometimes with six digits. Figures of men are depicted fighting, hunting, or apparently doing nothing at all. Other designs almost certainly represent the sun, moon, stars, lightning, clouds, rain, and corn. Always corn. That sacred and indispensable new world grain originally known as maize. Some signs tell of water springs, trails, or the abode of spirits. Others could be rebus writing. The, rep the representation of words by pictures of objects whose names sound in the aboriginal language like the intended words, as in our parlor game of charades. And this is the flute player in Oraibi, is much like those at Gila Bend and Chaco after waters. Wow, so yeah, what is the difference? The angles? The thicknesses? They're so similar. They're like the same. <laughs> Woo! Oh, excuse me. Did I show this to you? It's the same. Pretty much. Old wood engraving of rock inscriptions, El Moro Thayer, 1893. Man, I'm really excited to see the rock. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if they're um, hieroglyphs or petroglyphs, but I'll find out this this um, coming week. And then this next picture here is El Maro, now Inscription Rock National Monument near Gallup Thayer, 1893. Wow, that's cool. I really like that. <laughs> Balls. Is it just thick paper? It is. Why did the ancient people go to all that trouble? As a guess, some of the symbols were intended to invoke good or to repel evil, to assure a crop or to assist in childbirth. But probably nobody will ever know for certain what all of the Southwest's millions of pictographs and petroglyphs were supposed to mean or to do, since they never attained the status of a written language. Many of the figures might well have been nothing more than the product of idle doodling by people with time on their hands and a smooth surface to scribble on. People still do it, but now, usually, it is called graffiti. This is Newspaper Rock State Park. Utah displays hundreds of petroglyphs under cliff overhang. Mm -hmm. Casanova of the Ancient Ones, the Hunchbacked Flute Player. 
of the multitude of miscellaneous drawings, paintings, and scratchings on the rocks and in the caves of the pre-Columbian people of the Southwest, only one anthropomorphic subject can claim both an identity and a proper name, as well as gender. Without question, that figure is decidedly male. Cocopelli's frequent and widespread appearance on pottery and in pictography and pictography suggests that he was a well-traveled and universally recognized deity of considerable potency. A personality, an individual, the personification of a legend, a beneficent god to some and a confounded nuisance to others, such as such is Cocopelli. <laughs> such is Cocopelli, the famous hunchbacked flute player, the Kilroy of the Hohokam thousands of years old, but figuratively speaking, very much in the present. And then this is the picture on the front. Cocopelli, followed by his wife, Cocopelli Mana, embellishes a Hohokam bowl from Snaketown, Arizona. And this is after Gladwin. We're going to Kelly's Island, and there's a rock there that has a bunch of... Um, I think they might be petroglyphs, but they could be pictographs. And then there's also um, glacial grooves there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that. Plus, my sister's bringing her metal detector, and there's going to be some digging for minerals. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Present-day pottery makers, weavers, and painters often use the figure as a decoration, perhaps in many instances with no knowledge of the history or the significance of the representation. Fortunately, Cocopelli has never been a sinister character, never voodooistic, but frequently comic. Cocopelli appears from the San Juan Basin and Monument Valley to Casas Grandes in Mexico, among the Navajos, the Hopis, the Rio Grande Pueblos, and others westward to desert California. Not surprisingly, his phallic figure is among the thousands at Arizona's Painted Rocks State Park on the Gila River west of Gila Bend. Early Spanish explorers made note of the rock, of the rock carvings, and called them Piedras Pintadas, or Painted Rocks. Although the pictographs actually are incised or scratched rather than painted, early explorers, trappers, and hunters were not noted for their verbal precision. <laughs> Cocopelli on a screen-printed t-shirt by Southwest Sun of Columbus, New Mexico. I think I picked this up in a gift shop in the West years ago, but I'm not even certain. <laughs> Paintings on the rocks of Piedras Pintadas in Arizona, Brown, 1869. Wow, dude. Good art. <clears throat> Cocopelli's likeness varies almost as much as the legends about him, but by and large, he is unmistakable, un or he is unmistakable, grotesquely hunchbacked, usually phallic in the extreme, and nearly always playing some sort of flute or flagellate, flagellate like a flangey. It makes me think of the Pied Piper. And the dancing, the dancing curse. Oh my gosh. Who, oh, let's, I can't, I can't wait to hear what this is, more is this going to say? I mean, like he was, I always thought he represented fertility and abundance. Okay. So this picture group of four crude fruit, uh, flute, <laughs> son of a gun group of four crude flute players and plumed serpent in cave 
High in Canyon Wall, Los Alamos County, New Mexico, smoke on white pumice cave wall contrasts with scratched images. While some authorities say the flute is a blowgun, advocates of the musical instrument theory are in the majority. Man has been tootling through a nosepipe since the late Stone Age, virtually all over the world. Usually a man's instrument forbidden to women, a tube of reed, bone, or wood similar to the mouth flute was played by blowing nostril breath through one end. <laughs> Natives of Tahiti used to close one nostril with the thumb while wiggling the other fingers along note holes in the tube. Some clans preferred the left nostril, others the right. Some anthropologists surmise that note music or nose music arose from the belief of primitive man that the soul or life spirit entered and left the body through the nose. Past the pineal. <laughs> that yeah there was something i don't remember um maybe it was in eileen day mccusick's book where we talk about the bio field and how our energy field is like a the shape of a torus and the thought that when we perish that you've heard our life flashing before our eyes before. And what if it was like our energy field, the donut pulling in through our nose, past our eyes, past right out the pineal gland and up. I wonder, and that's like the last thing the eyes see and take with it. <laughs> Could be. So, so I'm going to read that. Some anthropologists surmise that nose music arose from the belief of primitive man that the soul or life spirit entered and left the body through the nose. The exclamation, God bless you, uttered when a person sneezes, may be rooted in the same belief that nostril breath possesses magical powers. <laughs> the breath, the prana, the chi, spiritus. The Cocopelli figure has been found in ruins of pit house people dating as early as 200 AD. Ooh, I gotta cough one sec. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> hey, welcome back, Genevieve. Awesome. So the Cocopelli figure has been found in ruins of pit house people dating as early as 200 AD and as late as the 16th century, where it appears in association with drawings of men on horseback, men armored, and men in cowls. Southwest sun fabric design. Silver earring enlarged to 50%. <laughs> hmm. I'm glad you survived to tell the tale. <laughs> Sneeze attack. <laughs> Arrival of the Spanish conquistadors and missionaries did more than establish and historical date as a base. Through the Inquisition, slavery, starvation, and disease, the natives were all but obliterated. Life in the Southwest was never again the same for Cocopelli and his people. Before the arrival of the Spaniards, however, pinning down historical dates becomes difficult to the point of impossibility. Sometime, or something can be learned from the chemistry of the petroglyphs etched on the smooth faces of 
basalt basaltic basaltic cliffs and caves i saw pictures of the basalt okay uh today just today just like this last hour the drawings are pecked or scratched through the dark brown patina known as desert varnish the product of centuries of slow oxidation of the minerals in the rock the artwork exposes lighter colored rock beneath the patina then over the centuries the lighter color colored rock will darken again and in time becomes virtually invisible invisible and then this is a small figure of cocapelli at san cristobal ruin um bum, 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 bum. This next picture is detail of figures on newspaper rock. Wow, it's like scrawl. Hey, no capitals, welcome in, awesome. -o. Casual scratchings by vandals are readily apparent because of their color and may be erased by park staff, as have those at Utah's newspaper Rock State Park, displaying thousands of figures. The rocks obviously served as a kind of bulletin board for people with no written alphabet. And then seated turtle-like figure is possible variation of Cocopelli, often found on Hopi pottery. This group is near San Cristobal ruins, southeast of Santa Fe in the Galisteo Basin. Hmm. It, maybe it's a hair too. <laughs> Two of the figures appear to be much older than the others, since they have become much darker than their neighbors. Also, the carvings must have been made when the floodplain at the base of the rock was much higher than it is now. Erosion of the terrain over the centuries has left the top of the rock high and dry and quite inaccessible without tall ladders. Another notable feature of the newspaper rock carvings is the presence of large six-toed feet, suggesting that there may have been a clan of, or family of six-toed people who were regarded as gods or in any case worthy of being reported on the rock. The scientific term for six toes is Polydact polydactylic, which does not help much since it simply means many digits. What? I'm counting five on each toe and four on this other one. A pair of re recumbent figures in C. Begay Monument Valley after Campbell photo. I count five, then four, then five, then five. A six-toed cat called Isabella. <laughs> Mr. Hugh, welcome in. Awesome. -o. Good to see you, dude. Now back to Cocopelli, whose outstanding feature was not his feet. The reason Cocopelli has a name is fairly simple. The Hopi people of central Arizona, aptly called archaeology on the root on the hoof, <laughs> which is in quotations. So it the Hopi people of central Arizona, aptly called archaeology on the hoof, make a variety of kachina dolls to sell to tourists. Among the dolls is one they call Cocopelli, and his wife is called Cocopelli Mana. Coco is hunchbacked and plays a flute. Formerly, he was vividly phallic, but the missionaries persuaded the Indians to omit his feature in the interests of what they, the missionaries, called decency. <laughs> the Hopis did not consider sex to be indecent, merely absurd. <laughs> this is a, petro a petroglyph of Cocopelli and Shield Sun? Question mark? Volcano cliff, cliffs near Albuquer Albuquerque after Campbell photo.
damn bean right it's longer than his legs <laughs> danger <clears throat> Another recumbent Cocapelli, Monument Valley, after Campbell. That, those, this Cocapelli is just three-toed. <laughs> like most genuine Kachinas, Cocapelli used to have a human counterpart in a Kachina dancer. The personification of a giant who lived in the mountains... What Cocapelli used to do with explicit gestures to the missionary ladies and female tourists before they learned what the gestures meant and why the Indians were convulsed with mirth would be worth elucidating. Cocapelli's exaggerated phallic appearance could have, could have been due to priapism or to tuberculosis or more likely to the common superstition that holds all hunchbacks to be fertility symbols. Ah, really? I didn't know that. Many primitive peoples welcomed Cocapelli around corn planting time. Barren wives sought his company. Unmarry maidens fled from him in terror. <laughs> Los Alamos County, New Mexico. Hey, I think we might have looked at that one already. Priapus, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, in both Greek and Roman ancient religion, religious lore, was a fertility god of gardens and, and herds. The son of Aphrodite and Dionysus. He was depicted as a grotesque little man with an enormous phallus, obviously important in fertility rites. Okay, so this is two small dancing figures are probably versions of Cocapelli without the flute. These are among many petroglyphs in the San Cristobal ruins. <clears throat> oh, it's this one. The circle, the darker circle, right? And then this picture is Oraibi women and maiden preparing food. Powell, 1875. Wow. The name Cocopelli may derive from Zuni and Hopi names for a god, Coco, and a desert robber, a desert robber fly they call Pelly. That predatory insect has a hump on his back and some deplorable habits, such as stealing the larvae of other flies. The flute could be the insect's prominent probo proboscis. Some of, well, okay, well, I think I know what that means. It's like, but let's look it up. Proboscis, P-R-O-B-O-S-C-I-S. Hagiography. Mm, bum, bum, bum. Probos. Pro probosis. 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 Oh. Probosis. 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 The nose of a mammal, especially when it is long and mobile, such as the trunk of an elephant or the snout of a tapper. T tapir? Tap tapper. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> ah. In many insects, an elongated sucking mouth part. Yeah, I was seeing mosquitoes the whole time, dude. Okay. Oh, balls, it's hot. Okay. But I got the fan right on me, so that's thankful. So, proboscis, is that what she said? Proboscis. No. Proboscis. 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 Boop. Okay. So, the flute could be the insect's prominent proboscis. 
Some of the drawings on pottery of the Hohokam and Mimbres people of prehistoric southern Arizona look more like the insect than the man. <laughs> look at the, yeah. It's still phallic, though. Okay, angular version of Cocapelli in cave on the Pajarito, Pajarito Plateau. Note how the long horn suggests an insect. Also, check out this weird, like, the way this second, I don't know if you can tell right here. All of a sudden, just that one word is like a different type of font. And it's all tiny. Southern. <laughs> I don't know. Or wait, maybe I should use my finger to show you right here. Okay, it's unimportant. <laughs> <laughs> However, <clears throat> it is among the present day Pueblo people of New Mexico and Arizona that the bulk of the Cocapelli legends were still current until fairly recent times. At San Ilde Ildefonso, Ildefonso. He was known as a wandering minstrel with a sack of songs on his back. In the Aladdin tradition, he traded new songs for old and was greeted as a harbinger of fertility and a god of the harvest. And this is the Old South Kiva at San Ilf Ildefonso after Campbell photo. Code, welcome in, dude. Good to see you. Dude. Um, you know, I, so I had to, I had to um, end that stream because I had to go, I was going to get, I had that appointment to go get tires. And um, while I was there, this, this adorable, awesome old man came in and started chatting me up and um, he was 87 and his name is um, Oliver, but just, but everyone calls me Sonny. And um, <laughs> he just, <laughs> turns out he's like the grandfather of the guy who owns the place. And um, he was just hanging out in there. And he just came in to chat it up with the people that were in there. And he gets to telling me a bunch of stories about his life. And um, he was a mechanic for 50 years. And then his wife, who he was like, my wife, she really made the good money though. She was a real estate agent. And then when he was 50, he retired and then they went and they did the real estate agency thing together. Well, she passed away three years ago. And then he says that he started dating this new woman and she's really nice. And, um, I asked him what her name was, what her name was. And, um, I thought maybe he didn't hear me. So I just kind of let it pass. And then like, a couple minutes later, he's talking about how nice she is. And I asked her, I asked him again what her name was. And um, <laughs> he said, <laughs> he couldn't remember. <laughs> he sat there looking so embarrassed. And like, he was like, well, I don't think she'd like that very much. <laughs> and like, <laughs> It was just too good. This man was just adorable. I'm telling you what. And then as the conversation went on, he just kept cracking jokes about not being able, not being able to remember what her name was. And then, um, but he said, but I, I have it written down by your phone number at home. So <laughs> I wish I could remember some of the funny things that he was saying about not remembering her name and stuff. And then at one point I asked him what his name was and he told me what it was. And I said, well, we're okay. You're not, you're not so bad off. At least you got your own name. And he was like, you, that's right. I got my own name. And so <laughs> it was great. <laughs> oh, it was great. Seriously. Sonny. I hope I run into him at a car show someday. He, like, he loves car shows. <laughs> I mean, I don't really go to car shows, but they are about. <laughs> what a what a cool dude. So anyways, yeah. Where am I here? Okay. However, 
It is among the present-day Pueblo people of New Mexico and Arizona that the bulk of the Cocopelli legends were still current until fairly recent times. Oh, wait, I read all that. Okay, so at Hano, on the Hopi First Mesa, occupied by Pueblo refugees from central New Mexico, Cocopelli and his wife are painted black. He is said to be a character they call Neop... Neop... Neopquai, 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 which means big black man. And that's spelled N-E-O-P-K-W-A-I apostrophe I. This, this could be none other than Esteban, the giant Moor who guided Fray Marcos de Niza and his party on their ill-fated exploration of southern Arizona in 1539. The Moors. Hmm. Shit, there was, so, there was something that I was reading yesterday and um, that Robert Sepperbook referenced the Moors too. Ah, the Moors. Fascinating. Okay, um... <clears throat> Esteban was more interested in the comely Zuni women than he was in the fabled seven cities of Chibola or Cibola, Cibola. The party was seeking. <laughs> I read that sentence great. <laughs> the seven cities of Cibola or Chibola, the party was seeking. The party was seeking. <laughs> When he made passes at the girls, the men decided he was no god after all and shot him full of arrows. <laughs> I like this writer. When they buried him under, then they buried him under, under a pile of rocks. Watching from a safe distance, <clears throat> Marcos de Niza and the rest of the party hastily erected a cross and then took off for Mexico City, where they had some hairy tales to tell. Hairy tales to tell. This is a picture of doorway and ruined wall at Hano, Hopi First Mesa, Mindelief, 1891. <clears throat> and then this picture is a terrace view of Zuni people, <clears throat> Cushing, 1883. Ooh, 100 years before my birth. <clears throat> at Oraibi, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly, another Hopi village, Cocopelli is said to have a sack of deerskin shirts and moccasins to barter for brides, a modified version of the Eastern or of the Esteban legend. Elsewhere, among the Hopis, he is said to spend his time sewing on shirts and <laughs> seducing the daughters of the household of the household while his wife, Cocopelli Mana, runs after the men. This is just interesting though. To think if that's like what they're saying, just like what is it? The um the box the box saga and the Oralinda the 12 benevolent kings and then they didn't just stop having babies but the 12 were the important ones and then the rest of them were labeled the moors and this is like sounding like that like they broke off then there was i don't know some uh some hurt feelings <laughs> about not being recognized as just important as the first 12 Hmm. Anyways, fascinating. I wonder. Cocopelli figures prominently in the obscure blue feather legend of the Navajos. This ancient tale says that the wandering Zuni named Blue Feather, who was very skillful with throwing sticks used like dice, bankrupted the great city of Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon, now a national historical a National Historic Park. 
This action led to the city's downfall in the 13th century, the story goes. Not satisfied with winning all the tribal treasure and lands, Blue Feather took over the running of the city. His delusions of grandeur led him to woo and win one of the city's sacred Vestal Virgins. This act of sacrilege brought down the terrible wrath of the gods in the form of drought and disease. The surviving people all ran away and the city collapsed, leaving Blue Feather buried in the ruins. As manservant to Blue Feather and bodyguard for the heroine of the peace, the hunchback Cocapelli either died in the ruins with his master or ran off with the girl, according to which version you, which version you prefer. And this is a quartet or jam session, question mark, Southwest Sun. I think these are like t-shirt designs. Esoteric alchemistic, most excellent. Tanya, awesome. Oh, welcome all. This is um, Ruins in Canyon de Shelley, Brickford, 1890. <clears throat> The Navajo tribe owns and guards one of the finest arrays of Cocapelli figures ever discovered. A long frieze of hunchbacked flute players adorns a large boulder sheltering a small ruin in a remote part of Monument Valley. The ruin was named Flute Player House by the archaeologists who, who excavated it in 1920. The real origin of these symbols, like other relics of the arcane Indian world, may be futile to seek in 20th century Anglo-Saxon terms and modes of thought. Perhaps there really was a hunchbacked minstrel with an eye for the girls somewhere in the dim past whose memory was come down through the ages like that of the wandering Jew. Or perhaps the same legend sprang up simultaneously among disparate people with no contact. Although this seems unlikely, in any case, the notion of a footloose and hunchbacked flute player with the gift of fertility must have satisfied some deep yearning of the ancient people, or they would not have nurtured the legend all the way down to the present day. This is House of Chief, of Chief Talti, Ora Ivi, Powell, 1875. <clears throat> White House Ruin in Canyon de Shelley, Brickford, 1890. Wow. Is this a, this is, this is a drawing. It almost looks like a picture, right? Like a photograph. That is impressive. That looks like a photograph. It's not. The Wrought Iron Security Grill, Bodies Indian Arts, Tucson. I like picture books. <laughs> oh my gosh, what the heck? <laughs> that is so random. <laughs> I just got to put it up on the screen for a second. <laughs> I say good luck, my friend. <laughs> Salty. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> okay. Oh, shit. That was the whole book, everyone. What a tiny little read. Oh, here's a couple more pictures, though. This is at Volcano Cliffs, Albuquerque. Cocapelli with horns resembles Navajo hunchback god. <laughs> Dang. High walls and ladder. Hano, First Mesa Hopi Village, Powell, 1875.
Dude, I love the art. Wow. This is Pac-Man Cocapelli. Looks like pain. In the Galisteo Basin, Cocapelli seems to be wearing a helmet and glowing a horn or and blowing a horn rather than a flute. A shield or sun symbol is in the front of him. After Munch. 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 Mummy Cave and Ruin, Canyon del Muerto. Wow, Canyon of the Dead. Brickford, 1890. And this one, what do we got? A pot bellied cocapelli toots another horn. St. John's, Arizona, after waters. Ooh, looks like an alien. This one we've already seen, but it says almost identical recumbent figures in Sonora, Mexico above and in Canyon de Shelley, Arizona, suggest a cocapelli resting at home. The Mexican figure found in a cave is almost 10 feet long after waters. And then this says <clears throat> this horned cocapelli from Cienaguita, New Mexico, may be the Navajo hunchback god who carries a spear or wand and a pack of seeds on his back. He is also called Water Sprinkler, after Renaud. This cocapelli has got a booty. <laughs> the end! Cocapelli, who was he? The Water Sprinkler? Wandering minstrel, fertility enchanter, or simply a hunchbacked flute player. <laughs> what a cool, what a little fun little read there. Uh, you spell it K-O-K-O-P-E-L-L-I. So thank you, everyone. That was really fun. I thought we would be able to get through it pretty fast. Um, I'm not sure what I'll go live with tomorrow, but I do think that's going to happen. So thanks for hanging out with me and stay cool out there or warm. Do it like you feel it mostly. And um, I love you. Thanks for the laugh. Thanks for the company. And I will see you all so soon. Mwah. Thank you very much. Good evening. <laughs>